Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning if you're there on the West Coast. Hi, everybody. This is Sonia. Uh, thank you for joining us here on the Solmanad Show with Sonia. Uh, I know that you could be a dozen other places, and yet you chose to join us here today. So we thank you very much for being here today. Soul stands for soul, mind, and body. And today we are going to tackle the mind. Remember when Marshawn Lynch said, be sure to take care of your mentals, right? So today is all about the mind. And today is mental health with hope. So we have a wonderful show for you today. We know that there's a lot going on here across the country and, and around the world as it pertains to, uh, to mental health care and um, the state of our mind. So we will get to that in just a moment. Um, I'll go over a couple things here before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, just want to um, mention uh, that... Uh, we did lose our, our girl, Michelle, uh, my girlfriend, Michelle, there in Seattle, um, just a few hours after the show last week, unfortunately. And so this show is dedicated to, uh, to you, my girl. I love you. Um, and it's just blessed and honored to know you for so long and be a part of your squad. Um, my love goes out to her husband, Ben, and both of the boys. Um, thank you to everybody who has locked arms and locked hearts with me for the last nine years as she was battling cancer. And, um, you know, praise God, she had been healed numerous times in that process. And so we did have her for nine years. So, um, Marco, I love you. <clears throat> and, uh, Look forward to when I can see you again, um, but our hearts go do go out to the family and um, all who loved Michelle. Um, <clears throat> so we will uh, move forward, and I know a lot of people are suffering loss in this season. Uh, it has been um, truly a challenging time, and we'll touch on some of that. You know, every week I have said that I'm going to highlight a restaurant, uh, a restaurant or two, and um, so this week, uh, the restaurant that we are going to highlight is called Soleil, and it is out of Chicago. So Gabe will be uh, sharing that here in just a moment. Um, if you want some good soul food um, made, uh, you know, high end and high class and high quality, uh, please step out and support them today. We always encourage you to support small businesses. And if you can give up one meal at home a week um, or even just a month and uh, order your food from a local restaurant, it really does make a tremendous difference. So shout out to uh, Soleil there in Chicago. Uh, speaking of Chicago there, my girl Danielle is in Chai Town. Hello to you, Danielle. I look forward to seeing you again. Excuse me, you guys. Look forward to seeing you again. I know you guys are under like two feet of snow. Uh, Sess, you are there in Chai Town as well. I texted you this morning. I hope that you can join us on the uh, flight attendant forum that we will be having here on the show on the 24th of February. Flight attendant forum. Uh, I'm bringing some amazing former colleagues here on the show, and we will be talking all things flight attendants stews, stewardesses, air hostesses, whatever you want to call us. It doesn't really matter, but it is a fascinating industry, one that um, people are constantly asking about and, and have many assumptions about, um, but they too are on the front lines in another form during this COVID crisis. And so we're going to bring some in the studio and, and we'll bring some uh, in on Zoom on February 24th, the Flight Attendant Forum. So look out for that and... Uh, check out Soleil there in Chicago, in Chi-Town. Um, I also wanted to mention to you, we have uh, my sister, my friend here in Minneapolis, uh, Beverly, reached out to me a couple weeks ago. You know, she has been there boots on the ground as well during this entire movement, um, fighting for justice, standing for justice. But what a lot of people don't know is she's kind of been... Um, uh, kind of like an, an undercover angel, if you will, you know, she's just been serving the community and um, she and her husband have just been going around serving the community. People aren't even aware, but she has, they have just been blessing people 
uh, hand over hand over hand, just supplying and meeting um, practical everyday needs. Uh, so she reached out to me and she said that uh, she is trying to put a resource list together here in the Twin Cities for anyone that needs anything, whether it's good soul food or a good criminal lawyer or a source for help with rent or utilities or rentals for felons or therapy for PTSD. Um, she's reaching out asking for my assistance and for my for me to extend this invitation uh, to ask you guys to join us and to see if you can help as well. Um, looking for for lawyers, anybody who deals with child custody, uh, or divorce, uh, or in the um, uh, for justice. Uh, of course, she really isn't concerned what race they are, but she does want to make sure that they are on the right side of uh, justice. And if you guys can go ahead and reach out to her directly, please go ahead and do that. If any of our viewers are on right now, if you can type in Bev, B-E-V, Williams, 9393 at gmail.com. Bev Williams 9393 at gmail.com. And this is a request to those of you in the Twin Cities who might have some resources available to you or recommendations. Uh, Bev will go ahead and follow up with each organization and um, and see what we can't do when we come together. And what is one of our mottos here at Soul Monad? It's together we can and together we will. So Bev, shout out to you guys. I love you. Um, I know that you've you've walked this this walk um, of injustice and of of other needs yourself, and um, so you're coming from a place of experience. And I just love how you are so strong. You're a warrior, uh, always extending love and grace and compassion. And what do we say here at Solmanad? We say inhale love um, to exhale compassion. So uh, thank you for everybody who can contribute. And if you have any other questions, of course, feel free to reach out to me at Sonia at Solmanad.com. Uh, the contact information there is on the website, uh, Solmanad.com. Okay, you guys, let's go ahead because we have a big show today, a very important show today um, as it pertains to um, mental health. Uh, so without any further ado, I would like to welcome uh, our guest on the show today. Jennifer Lubonsky is a licensed mental health counselor. She is coming to us from central Washington. Jen, welcome to the Solmanad Show with Sonia. Hello, Sonia. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, to be here, in fact, so busy as we were um, going over things yesterday, you know, you were just saying the needs are so great that um, that you're just completely backed up that there's waiting lists, um, uh, which is also partially encouraging because, I mean, it shows that the needs are great, but it's showing that people are reaching out. And of course, that's what we want to encourage folks to do today. So, Jen, welcome to the show. So glad that you're here. Uh, see if I can get these glasses on. You know, I'm of a certain age now, so I need this extra assistance here. Okay. All right. So, Jen, you know, we have been in uh, a very long and difficult season. Of course, everybody is aware, um, you know, both, uh, both uh, politically and the divisiveness in the nation. Um, and then with uh, racial injustice. And then, of course, on top of that, uh, you know, why not just throw in one more crisis? And so we're in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> a lot it's been a lot it's a lot it's a lot to deal with i do want to address uh children specifically uh here in just a moment um you know i think that that our little ones you know with their developing minds and and not much experience yet in life um have very particular uh needs and so i i want to address uh, that for the children later but um Jen, you, you're a licensed um, a counselor out there and you've been helping so many people. Can you just share with us what, what you have seen the difference from, you know, say 2018, 2017, a few years ago, to what you have witnessed here taking place in the last eight or nine months? Well, there's, a, and there's so many differences on so many levels, yeah. but certainly uh, many more uh in the children, teenage range that are 
I mean, yeah, the suicide rates are looking like they may double. You know, we don't have those numbers, but there's emerging information from ERs in different places that say perhaps double the suicide rate, particularly in younger children. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that teenagers and it's harder to connect with children on telehealth, which is what everyone has gone to telehealth to be Mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. There's very few people meeting in person. So that means some people are choosing not to get care because they're uncomfortable with telehealth, which is a shame um, because it actually has been really powerful for some. But Mm -hmm. I've seen more teenagers talking about suicide, feeling like they're carrying the weight of other friends who are talking about suicide Mm. and just Mm. this sense of lost hope. If I carry it up through that early adulthood launch time, that whole age group is where I really see uh, the most impact Mm -hmm. because suddenly uh, all of their hopes for the future, all their dreams have gone away, right? They, what they planned for is just suddenly not even in their grasp, college, you know, graduation, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry. I did not put my dog out the door and she's going to start whining now and interrupt our show. So I'm going to just put her out my door here and then yep. come back. Yep. That's all right. That's all right. Um, you know, we can just go ahead and start with kids. And while Jen is putting her pup out, um, love our pups. I will read this to you. This um, came into the NPR and it says, this is some information about uh children and suicides here just in the United States. Um, So Jen, we will go ahead and start with the children then. So it says here, in recent months, many suicidal children have been showing up in hospital emergency departments and more kids are needing inpatient care after serious suicide attempts. Across the country, we're hearing that there are increased numbers of serious suicidal attempts and suicidal deaths, says Dr. Susan Duffy, a professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at Brown University. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, between April and October 2020, hospital emergency departments saw a rise in the share of total visits that were from kids for mental health needs. Now, there are no additional, uh, excuse me, there are no nationwide numbers, as you had mentioned, on suicide deaths in 2020 yet. And researchers have yet to clearly link recent suicides to the pandemic. Yet on the ground, there's growing concern. NPR spoke with providers at hospitals in seven states across the country, and all of them reported a similar trend. More suicidal children are coming to their hospitals in worse mental states. That is so tragic. And so we will go ahead and start with the children then. So you, you, do you have children that, that in your practice that come to you or the families that are coming to you, um, whether it's in person or, or um, uh, over the, the, the what, do, what do you call tele-health. it? Tele- yeah. tele-health. Conf- yeah. Telehealth. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Telehealth. Mm-hmm. So yeah. go ahead. Yes, yeah, I'm seeing them. And sometimes that information is happening more uh, in passing because children are, well, they're at, they're at home uh, because of school being on the internet or having limited time with their in school. And then parents mm-hmm. are trying to work. So some of them are not even receiving services because there's, a lot of times the parents don't know how desperate the kids are is what I'm hearing sure. here. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it their home? A lot of times to make things work, uh, parents are out of the house during the day and the kids sleep during the day and then they mm. get their work done in the evening and are up at night. They just have this different schedule thing going on because everybody's trying to make everything work. Mm-hmm. And so I've seen that where then kids aren't really getting any daylight and there's kind of this strange schedule. And we know that all of that impacts mental health. Then, yeah. And we know that they aren't able to connect to friends the way they're being used to connect to friends. Mm-hmm. A lot of them can play video games or, you know, text with people, but overall just being able to go out and connect with people. Right. Um, all of those platforms have been taken away from children which is mm-hmm. really to some extent taking away childhood, which is all about play right. and interaction. Right. 
Right. And then there are those who uh, who are involved, say, in sports. And for so many personality types, they really need that physical, aggressive, you know, outlet, um, that that competition, the working out, the coaching, in addition to, you know, the interaction that that brings in a sense of community. Um, and so all of those kids are just, have just been abruptly, you know, pulled from that. And that's come to a screeching halt um, in most states. I know it varies from, from state to state um, and as it does around the world. But that's what I've, I read as well, is that those kids uh, in that category are, are just devastated by that. And, and some have expressed, um, what else is there, you know, if all I had was my, you know, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, whatever. Yeah. And I have one of those. My youngest is one of mm-hmm. those very active. Mm-hmm. And that gets challenging at home, too, because they need an outlet for that. And sometimes then it can come out in between family and then everybody's sure. getting escalated, right? Yeah. Uh, his, and there are particularly some who have ADD who kind of thrive off of that. <laughs> I'm going to push against you kind of yeah. dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. to some extent, they need it. It's part of what kind of moves them and propels them forward. Sure. Mm-hmm. We don't want to make sure. all of these things bad. They're kids, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's, I think this is going to be one of the big things that we may have to reconcile is how long can we live this way? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what trade-offs are we making? What ones are we going to feel comfortable making in the long term? Yeah. Yeah, and that's why, you know, here on the show, we're always talking about the importance of praying for our leadership, um, local, statewide, national, uh, international, global, uh, just to pray for our leaders that they'll make the right decisions, you know, whatever that is for for each situation. Um, You know, also in schools, another thing that I've been reading a lot about is that literally some of the teachers and guidance counselors are having a difficult time even tracking down some of the kids because of the dynamics at home. And so we have children who are literally just falling off the radar here. There are, there are children falling off the radar and some of them are fine. They just have parents who are working, who don't have the energy to make yeah. sure that they're logging in on time. And then yeah. there are others that aren't. It's like, it's desperate. Um, mm-hmm. Parents who are feeling desperate and uh, and they don't have anywhere to go right now and they don't have any safety eyes on them. Mm-hmm. And that is certainly concerning. And I can vouch for that too, because some of, some of the work I do, I've contracted with CPS in the past mm-hmm. where I go in and I do uh, interventions in the home when families are in danger of losing their children. And even Mm -hmm. those services have really pulled away and gone to telehealth and you can't Mm -hmm. do the same work when you work in the home, but it's a great risk to be in those homes too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know you were a former uh, school teacher, so I I know, and a mother. And so uh, I know that you just have a special place in your heart for, for our children today and for this, this crisis that they're in, you know, I had heard about this before and then I even read that in that article is uh, I understand some people are looking at the idea of creating an organized, um, you know, there's there's a wellness check that, of course, we can do with our CPS and, you know, systems here within our government statewide, national, nationally and stuff. But what about a, a mental check, you know, a mental wellness check in light of the situation that we're in right now with COVID? You know, having, I, I don't know who would, would back that, you know, which organization. And of course, it would take a lot of money, but we, we definitely, um, you know, don't have a shortage of trained professionals who can be a part of that and, and check in on our, our little ones and be a support for the families. I mean, these young families, uh, I, I thank God I'm not having to go through this right now, but they are working full time. Now they have become, you know, Nanny McPhee when in last week we Cheryl and and I had talked on the show last week. These people are now the, the full time caregivers for their children when really in so many homes across America, they might be able to see them for breakfast. But then out the door, they go for their commute to go to work and then they come home and maybe they'll be home in time for dinner and tuck them into bed. And that's it. You know, so Monday through Friday, they're seeing their children two or three hours a day, maybe. And now it's all day, 24-7. Cheryl said last week, it's kind of like somebody looking at their child. And who are you? 
Which isn't that such a mixed bag, right? Because it is all of a sudden this is on my shoulders, but we also have this incredible return to family Mm -hmm. and to the importance of family and Mm -hmm. and parenting. And we know that long-term mental health for children really is contingent on these healthy relationships at home. Mm -hmm. And so it can be kind of a a redemptive season too. Mm -hmm. It it just depends to some extent, it depends on how we look at it, Mm -hmm. the outcomes that we have. And that we talk about in mental health all the time. Your outcome absolutely depends on the meaning you're making of the situation. Mm -hmm. More than anything Yes, absolutely. And so much of what we keep talking about on the show over and over is, is, um, you know, perspective, uh, you know, in the midst of crisis and the crisis that we're in, we're all in it at different levels. And, you know, some people are, they're definitely in a code red crisis. Um, but the, the power of the mind and the lens in which you see things and, and what your perspective is can come have a direct effect on the outcome of your every day. Can you give our families um, some key tips, Jen, for their children, for their littles, for their, you know, their, their, what do they call tweeners? No. Yeah. Right before they're teenagers. Yeah. (laughs) It's been so long since I've had those, Um, you know, and those kids who are transitioning from high school to, uh, to college who have missed out on their last season of whatever, or, you know, being able to, uh, to shine and showcase for that scholarship or, you know, have that graduation ceremony or whatever it is. Can you give our viewers just some key points that maybe, you know, they can take these nuggets, apply it to their lives and have a positive uh, effect on on them for themselves and for their children and their families yeah man it, this is one of those where it's challenging to not be in each situation and see but a few things come to mind mm-hmm. one is the importance of joy yeah and creating joy mm-hmm. and thinking about how do you build joy uh there's this idea in neuroscience that we can only process as much negative emotion as we have built joy into Mm -hmm. our life, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have this massive amount of grief and loss and uh, challenges and fear. I'm just going to say there's a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And the only way for us to really process and come to a place of uh, making meaning and thriving is to find where's our joy and how do I build our joy? Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that, main ways we do that is in relationships, right? Smiling at someone. It used to be you could, you know, go to a grocery store and smile. Right. In your home, how do you make places where people would smile? And we know that this is important for learning, that children, all of us, need a positive brain space in order to learn. And so people talked about this in March, but we kind of have forgotten about it, and I'm not hearing it as much now, even though we just went through, like, Let's just be honest. The political thing was just crazy and we're all just shell shocked right now. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So we need to remember to go back to those nurturing and care things that we did way back in March because we've just, we just took another hit. Yeah. And so how do we step back and take care of ourselves, nurture the places of joy and remember that that's going to be the thing that actually helps us. It's not going to be, whether I know how to do algebra. Eventually that's really important, but I'm not going to be able to learn it Mm -hmm. when all of this is going on. And whatever challenges we face as we overcome them and become resilient, we actually are then stronger and able to move through things in the future. Mm -hmm. So we can look at these challenges as opportunities, but it's sometimes it takes a deep breath and it takes remembering okay, well, today I'm going to enjoy this really nice glass of chocolate milk, or yeah, <laughs> right? right? Or I'm going to go smell the flowers. Or I'm going to watch a snowflake come down. The simple I'm things. Gonna, yeah, hold my baby in my arms mm-hmm. and think, yeah. what, can I, what can I be thankful for? What can I sit right here in this space and be fully present and yeah. say, I'm thankful for this? 
um, those are the things that are going to pull you through. You know, when I do uh, premarital counseling for my couples I officiate for, um, I talk to them about the power of pause. And isn't that so powerful for the parents um, to apply one to another and to themselves, but to teach and give that tool to their children, the power of pause. Yeah. And, you know, so it's okay to know, Ooh, I need to go to my room. If you're blessed enough to have another adult in the house, which isn't always true to tag out and go, you're on. Cause I'm at capacity right now. Mm-hmm. And because the reality is we all feel the pressure and have those moments where, Right. I call it like a, like a Minto in a Coke bottle. If you've ever seen that explosion, there are mm-hmm. times when I'll just tell my family, I need to step out because I'm like a Minto in a Coke bottle right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to step mm-hmm. back. Right. Mm-hmm. And we all get there, especially when there's kids at home and the pressures of life and trying to make ends meet when things aren't working as we're used to them working. Don't be surprised that you're there. Welcome to where we are. We are mm-hmm. all there. And sometimes the best hope I can give you is that everyone around you is experiencing that right now, too. Yeah. Yeah, Jen, I think that's a really good point is um, isolation can isolation can stir up hopelessness and despondency, which can lead to desperation and the lie and believing that they are the only person in the world who is going through whatever crisis is that they're going through. And so wouldn't that be so important if the parents were reminding the children that the whole world, or maybe for their little minds, the whole neighborhood or all the families at school are going through this as well in their own homes so that the children aren't feeling so overwhelmed in this isolation and there's different levels of it based on the the limits at each state but um just reminding them they're not alone and there are many people that that can relate and are experiencing the same or very similar uh levels of that loneliness and feeling that nobody else gets it and you know what's interesting is kids catch things they it's like osmosis they're learning at home Yeah. And so that's where we have to be asking ourselves, where am I finding hope, right? And sometimes yeah. that means fixing the scariest place uh, in our hearts right now and go, how how would I make it through that scary place? Because the kids are hearing, you know, that mm-hmm. the government's crazy. The kids are hearing what you say about COVID. Yes. They're, even if you think you aren't saying it to them, they're catching all of that and there is this desperate need for hope. And if the children have 10 years and they think, well, there's no hope for years for them, that's, that's forever. Right. That is forever in their little minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't have any perspective beyond where they are. And so if they're, if our children are going to have hope, we have to find way, a way to be people of hope. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And what about, um, I, I just had this vision again, I know I, I talk about often uh, when we're in that dark place and we're feeling down and we're, we're discouraged, the natural reaction, of course, is head down, look at self, and then that's all you see. And we want to have the importance of looking up looking toward the future as well, which I think hope is so much a a, a part of that. And so what about the power of the parents talking about the future and how, you know, we, the plan is, we can say, uh, that they will be back in school again. We will join with our family members and our friends and the team will play football again and there will be dance recitals once again. And, you know, talking about the future and encouraging them to lift up their heads and look forward as opposed to just looking down and inward at that dark place that they're feeling in that moment. Yeah, you know, there is this, uh, they've done a study and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't, I can't Uh reference it, but uh, the idea is that planning for a trip, uh, is as healthy 
has is as good for your mental health as actually taking a trip. Like mm-hmm. whether or not the trip happens, that planning is what mm-hmm. creates a positive mental space. And so if we're going to do this, we don't even have to stay inside any kind of box. We can dream big. Yes. Right? Yes. Dream as big as you want with your kids. Be crazy. And yeah, all of it is communicating hope. Right. Yes. And whether mm-hmm. or not we get there, we still established hope and we still brought our eyes up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just dialoguing with your kids and having those conversations uh, about that trip and about that activity that you're going to do in the future. It gets those endorphins going. And those are those are all the good feels for the mind. And when you have all the good feels for the mind that directly affects the body. And I can attest to that. I go on a lot of trips and I love looking forward to my trips. (laughs) Yeah. And how do we, you know, kind of envelop that idea in everything we're doing when we go for a walk through the community? I can't wait to look in, you know, take cookies to our neighbors again or whatever that thing is that gives you hope. I can't wait till we can, you know, walk dogs again or give high Mm -hmm. fives. Mm -hmm. Just even in the little things. Or in the big things, you know, what if we got to go to Hawaii or to Europe or Mm -hmm. dream, whatever gives your heart a lift, whatever gives your child's heart a lift, Mm -hmm. you know, why not sliding down a rainbow? Why can't you imagine that maybe someday you could slide down a rainbow? Sure. There's no harm in that imagination. Right, right, right. And um, the other thing I was just now uh, thinking of, too, is... um, you know, in looking for the future is uh, sometimes uh, when they're when they're down, you know, they can be kind of short sighted. Um, But we do want to validate their feelings. And you should actually speak at this better than than I can. But, uh, you know, we do want to validate their feelings. But we don't want to spend so much time and focus and energy on that, that everything gets gets focused in on that as opposed to the solutions and hope. And and so there's the importance of having empathy and validating those feelings. But then what do you do with that? You know, what, then what would be the, the positive response and, and maybe what might rectify their situation? You can speak that much better than I, Jen. (laughs) No, you are very right. We, there is an importance to validating the feelings and not having what I've heard referred to as toxic positivity. Yes. Where you just aren't allowed to say, oh, this is bad or this is rough. Yeah. yeah. We have to right. be authentic in where we are. Yes. And I guess the, the thing that I think about when you say that is I have this little spiel that I give to anyone who comes into my office dealing with depression. Mm-hmm. And I talk about that depression is a house that's built of two walls. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all my fault and there's nothing I can do about it. And you spin back and forth between those. And part of being authentic and real about those thoughts is to acknowledge that they're there and then follow them to what it means. So if something is all my fault, Mm -hmm. I need to follow that to the end. Okay. If this is really my fault, then there is something I can do about it, whether it is, you know, making amends, going to someone and talking, uh, dealing with my shame because it already happened. Sure. There is something you can do about it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if it isn't your fault, there's a different journey, but still just as real of, I don't have power over this. Right. I have to surrender this. Mm-hmm. And this is really uncomfortable. And I don't like that I can't change this thing. But right. this one's not in my power. Yeah. And really the only way out of depression is to dismantle those thoughts. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, I i mean, I had my own journey out of depression. I had, um, after I had my daughter, I actually was depressed for a while. Mm-hmm. And the so that brings me to the other thing that nobody could come inside where I was in that bubble mm-hmm. and bring mm-hmm. me out. Even though I deeply wanted people too. I wanted to know that they loved me. I wanted all of those things, Mm -hmm. but in my depression, there was no way to reach me. Mm. And so depression is like a labyrinth and you're Mm -hmm. inside when you have depression and you have people on the outside who are calling to you and saying, I love you. I'm out here, but nobody can walk that path for you coming around and tackling each of those thoughts until you come out. 
Mm-hmm. And so there is this, this balance of, I want to be with you and I see you, I see your pain and I love you. And I can't actually walk this journey for you. Yeah. I can just be out here saying, keep coming. You're doing it. You yeah. can get better. I know it's hard. Yeah. Keep going. Right. So how powerful would that be if, if our parents felt um, empowered uh, and equipped to be the, the biggest and baddest and best cheerleaders for their kids, even in the middle of crisis. Now, when everything's going smooth, of course, that's easy to do, right? But now in this situation, you know, in this season of crisis that we're in, what if they can see, receive what you just said, and they can just be right there. You know, I can't walk this for you. You know, they they realize that. And so they're right there just saying, you got this, Joey, you know, you can do this. I'm right here for you. I'm right beside you. And then give them the positive affirmations that they're needing and talk about hope and, and, and be proactive and intentional about bringing joy back into the home and be patient in in the process Uh, one thing that I uh, preach but I preach to myself too and I'm always praying for is I call it peace in the waiting I pray for peace in the waiting because so often in life we're waiting and yet we're in the society where we want things to happen right now but look we we've gotten to where we are uh in regards to COVID, anyway uh you know for uh, 11 months now it took 11 months and then if you go back to the racial injustices and and political upheaval and and the little ones are sensing all of this all the stress and they're hearing they're feeling it all so it's taken us a long time to get to where we are so it probably isn't going to be happening overnight so if we can all just be patient maybe extend grace even to ourselves one to another as we are extending that grace and that support and that encouragement to our little ones so sonia tell me about your peace in the waiting what are some of the tools you use for that Uh, peace in the waiting uh well for me um you know, I'm I'm a, a Jesus follower. I'm a Christian, and of course, you know that. And I, I think our viewers all know that. So, for me, in my practice, um, I'm very prayerful. Uh, I have a load of scripture memorized. Um, thank goodness when I was at church by the side of the road as a little girl, I think that's when that mind is molding. There's so much scripture. But the way that I see it is that each one is, um, it's a tool that I need. So when, when I'm in crisis, when I'm being impatient, and when I want to see that result now, uh, I, I want to reach for the correct tool. And so in a toolbox, you know, if, if you're needing um, a nail to nail in there, you know, then you're not going to reach for a wrench. You need a nail. And when you're needing a wrench to use in that moment, you're not going to grab a paintbrush, you know, so it's it's a matter of grabbing the right tools. And for me, first of all, is um, the moment, the power of pause. Just take a breath. And I say uh, to my my couples that are going to get married, just take take a breath, just take a beat, just take a beat. And then I remember that God is with me. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. He is right here with me. And I do trust him for his timing for all things. And so I ask, is there something that I need to do in this moment? Or have I done everything that I need to do? And so now it's in God's hands. And so I just wait. And so I ask for his peace in the waiting, that I would be anxious for nothing at all, but to cast those cares right back onto him and say, Lord, give me your peace. See, my peace that I create, that you create, that man creates is uh, is very limited and um, it doesn't uh, tend to endure. <laughs> and so I ask for the peace of God that really is beyond our comprehension and understanding to help me and to grace me and to bless me while I'm waiting and then that time comes with whatever it is and 
over and over again, I'm always in awe. And it's almost like it's an aha moment all over again, yet by the first time. The power of asking for that peace in the waiting. Yeah, I love that. I love how you said that. And there's so much in that. And I I also am a Christ follower, but as a mental health counselor, I don't always get to say that to people. Right. Yes, right. It's really, it's a journey that I have to walk to and sure. trying to give as much hope as I can without always sharing all that's in my heart. Mm-hmm. And in, in that, I think as you were talking, I thought of a couple tools that I kind of use regularly. Mm-hmm. And one of them, even though I'm not a Christian and people aren't necessarily Christians, there's a scripture that people tend to know out in the world and uh, are open to engaging with on a regular basis. And that's the 23rd Psalm yeah. that opens with the Lord is my shepherd. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. there are times when I will actually do a visualization with people of just imagine that you're there in that field and the Lord is your shepherd. What does it look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where are you? Where's the Lord? Mm-hmm. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. And you can just sit on that one for a really long time in this moment where it's hard. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what we need most is just to be in that moment and that no, like for right now, I'm alive for right now. If I just need a be. wrench, there will be a wrench right yeah. right now. I don't have to look any further than right now. Right. I can be in this moment. Just be. Um, yeah. 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 And and sometimes we've forgotten to do this. And to some extent, I feel like this year has been a reminder that we can just be. Yeah. 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 It's okay. And in talking with so many of um, the, the parents out there that have the little ones, um, they're reaching out and they're um, in tears, in tears quite often, um, just about to lose their minds and how am I going to work and how am I going to do this? And now I have to teach them this. And and speaking of math, I guess there's this whole new way of teaching math. I don't know. Um, But anyway, and how am I going to do that? And how am I? And they look at themselves as a failure and where this high level of expert, uh, 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 excuse me, this high level of expectation has come from with something that has never happened before in modern time. So there is, there is no bar, okay? Th- this is our first collective rodeo, <laughs> right? Right. And so I, I, I just want to encourage people to be patient with themselves. Be patient with one another. The, these aren't failures. They certainly aren't epic failures. They're not even failures. And in fact, if we can even bring in a little bit of humor into the situation, I, like you, know many school teachers out there. And guidance counselors. You know, Vernon's parents were both guidance counselors there in, in Newark and in Princeton for decades. Um, they're extending grace on a daily basis. Everybody's being very patient. You know, they're, they're, that bar should not be set up here. So to all of you moms and dads that are out there today and you think that you need to just be you know, uh, June Cleaver and you need to be Nanny McPhee and, and you need to, you know, just be the best of the biggest and the baddest out there and do everything perfectly. You don't. Nobody is expecting perfection. Nobody's even expecting anything close to perfection. One thing, though, that humor will really help. So don't let the humor uh, leave your heart and don't let it leave your home. Be patient with yourself. Continue to encourage one another. But some things we just don't have control over. We're not expected to. You are one mother and you are one father out there. And to all the aunties and uncles and grandparents who have the loved one in their home, they're the guardian. You are one woman. You are one man. You are not expected to do the work of five people in helping to rear and raise this precious one. Great. And I love that. I think humor really keeps us from a lot of things. Yeah. It's sometimes it keeps us from being offended and a offense just grows into sure. bitterness in your life, right? Mm-hmm. So being able to laugh when things are ridiculous. Yeah. Right. <laughs> very freeing. Because mm-hmm. sometimes they really are ridiculous. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it 
isn't fair and it's out of your hands, right? Yes. And that is one thing that I've always taught my children, which again, I have to remind myself, but um, sometimes it, it isn't always fair or it isn't somebody's fault. I say it just is. Mm-hmm. It, it just is. Right. Um, people tend to want to, to point that finger and, and to blame or to blame shift or, and then if we knew whose fault it was, and, and then maybe we can contend with this and then maybe, but that's not always necessarily so. And especially in light of the times that we're in right now. And sometimes I say, I just had to laugh at this or at that because the alternative was to cry or to scream or to lose my mind. And so if I can have a little bit of joy and humor well up in my heart, hey, that's a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The joy and the humor and then someplace to fall when you just, when it just hits you in the gut, right? Yeah. Yep. And that's where uh, another tool I was thinking about when you were talking is called uh, the body prayer. Mm -hmm. Tell us. It's. Uh, basically, it's the idea of you put your hands in front of you and imagine all of your thoughts on a topic. And what I love about this prayer is you don't actually use any words. You just put all of it out there in your hand. Okay. As if it's a shape or a color, all mixed up. Okay. And then uh, for me, it's hold it up in the presence of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So however that works for other people, but the idea of... Mm-hmm the God of the universe being in it with you and seeing all of it, seeing the messiness of it, Mm -hmm. seeing your good thoughts and your bad thoughts and all of it. And just being honest, this is it. There it is. And -hmm. then when you feel like he's really in there with you, that's when you can finally lift it up and let it go and say, okay, I'm going to give it to you now. Um, And just let it go. But that point of, Hmm. and just let it go. Yeah. Hmm. But first you have to know that somebody sees it fully. Yeah. And yeah. that's the idea of God out there that can see fully right. what other people mm-hmm. can't. You know? I love that. And, and, you know, that's something that we can teach our children. Anybody can teach your children. The, the two-year-old can do that. And, and the 22-year-old can do that. And my goodness, the 82-year-old can do that. Mm-hmm. And right? I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about, as you, you know, as you said that, I'm thinking about what's in my hands. Jen, can we talk about what are we allowing to be in our hands and on our shoulders? That burden, that burden that that we were never supposed to bear. That burden that we were never, ever supposed to carry. It was never ours to have in the first place. So how about being a more selective and purposeful in allowing to come into our mental space of what it is that is ever supposed to be on our plate in the first place. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting journey for us to figure out sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. It leads back to that all my fault or nothing I can do about it. Or, mm-hmm. And when you say that, I don't know that I have the perfect answer. I know that I have an experience recently where I was bringing something to God and bringing something to God. And he said, not your problem. He said it kind of sharp. There you go. There you go. <laughs> not your problem. And I was like, oh. And so there is this reality of weighing yeah. which things are mine to carry. That one's not my problem. I don't have to do right. that anymore. Right. Yeah. And you had touched on this before. Um, I, th- I'll just piggyback on that by reiterating reiterating what you had said before of, you know, our sphere of influence and our sphere of control, you know, that which we have control over and that which we don't. So certainly if we can even first of all recognize, is this anything I would have any control over anyway? So A, and if the answer is no, then it doesn't go here. It's not going to get around my mic here. It's not going to go here. It's not going to to be on my plate. So I am just going to reject that right now because that is not even my stuff. Like how God just said to you, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Yeah. And sometimes we have to go, okay, I see this. So I don't know. I'm going to pretend I'm throwing it away. Sometimes just going through a mental or physical action to Mm -hmm. go. and, And then you can remind yourself, wait a second, I threw that out there. Or maybe right. I wrote it on a piece of paper and I burned it. Remember I burned right. it or 
buried it. <laughs> right. Sometimes we go through those physical actions so we can remember. That one's not mine. I, um, my, my biggest aha moment um, that I always draw from, and I've shared with so many people over the years, uh, it was a, a kind of similar in what you said when God was like, uh-uh. Well, we had our three young babies and my husband and I are at each other's throats all the time and we're young. We don't have all the wisdom and everything yet, right? <laughs> Not that we ever arrive, but, you know, here we are. We're we're in our late 20s and we're just going at it. And, you know, the finances aren't always the best because we're still kind of coming up in our careers and three little rug rats are running around the house and there's no sleep and yada, yada, yada. You get it, right? <laughs> I was driving home one day. I think I had just dropped the kids off at mom and dad's in Skyway. And I, t- I remember I took that 45th Street exit uh, just, um, is it just north of Green Lake, right? North of downtown Seattle off of I-5. And I was driving my white minivan. And then there was just an instant torrential, torrential downpour. And, you know, we don't get torrential rain in Seattle. We get a lot of rain, but not that torrential downpour, you know, like I'm used to getting here in the Midwest. And of course in the South, you know, it's just like a monsoon and it was, it was immediate and instant. It just started that pierced my heart. And I began to cry out to God. I mean, cry, yell, screeching, sobbing, snot running down my face, the whole nine yards. And he spoke to me and he said, pull over. And so I pulled over and he said, hold out your hands. And I said, and I held out my hands. And the Lord said, you're holding those reins. Look at those reins that you're gripping, that you're holding so tight. And I was like, yeah. And he said, those were never yours to hold. And I need you to release that right now and trust me. And I could cry right now in this moment because of the power of that. You know, I was so caught up in myself and what I was going to do in what situation I was going to Olivia Pope before that show ever was on TV, you know, because I'm a fixer and I was going to fix it. Right. And I was just convicted in that moment. But in that moment, and so I, I had my hands up. And so I literally over the steering wheel, gave it over to God, you know, just with the hand gesture with what I was, you know, sensing in the spirit. I handed those reins over to God and I have never taken them back. I think at that time I was 29 years old and I've mm-hmm. never forgotten that. And I have shared that with so many people of all ages because it's powerful and so important. Don't take on and put in here, like what you like what you were saying, what we're not supposed to grip it and hold on to and to carry and to have that burden. And, you know, I mean, oh my goodness, my stomach was upset and I just, I was hurting and my stomach was nauseous because then when our hearts are affected and we have all this going on in our mind, it affects our physical state as well. Yeah. And that was so freeing and so liberating. And today with what we're going through, that, what did you call it? You called it the body prayer. Mm -hmm. That is just such a powerful tool to go to. And anybody can do that at any age and in any moment. I do it regularly when I go, oh, I just can't do it, right? Over and over again you know Jen before we were we were on air you were um you mentioned something to me let me look at my notes here you had mentioned something to me that I I wanted us to touch on and that I wanted us to touch on and you had said um you know that many people in this great season of loss I mean people they've lost life they're there are many that have passed away um in this season and of course many that have passed away um from their from natural causes but when they got covid you know maybe they they would have been fine otherwise take high blood pressure for example take asthma for example take smokers for example you know they were fine in their lives prior to you know getting that and it's just has been such a season of pain 
and of loss. And you had said that that you you are recognizing that people are grieving lost dreams. Yeah. And in this season, the 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 dream thief has come. And so many dreams have been have been stolen. Yeah. And so how would you encourage people to dream again? Isn't that the question? I think I've wrestled that with people, even said that way, to dream, right? Yeah. Without without vision, without dreams, people perish. Yes. And that's really, you know, the hope we're looking for is to know that there's a dream again. Yeah. I don't have all the answers for that. I do know that there's this principle in transition and change, and it links really nicely with your letting go of the reins, yeah. um, that there's a letting go. I have to know, I have to define what I've lost. I have to know I'm mourning this dream that I'm lost. I'm mourning this normal reality. I'm, mor- I'm mourning my kids going to school every day and what that meant for my life. Whatever it is, go ahead and, sure. and name those things, right? Mm-hmm. And then we actually grieve them um, almost like a death. And if, if we don't, then we end up in depression. And so there's this reality of letting this grief process be a part of our life. So there are people who are grieving real losses like you, your friend, Michelle, and, mm-hmm. you know, we had some of those in our family too, like for real grief and loss of people, yeah. but there's also yeah. a grief and loss of dreams. And there's this point where you, like you define what you lost. And then there's this kind of chaotic space in between where you have to define yourself again without that. Mm-hmm. Who am I without this dream? And yeah. you actually have to go through that uncomfortable process before you can say, okay, you know, this is, this is where I'm going now. Mm-hmm. I have a new identity that doesn't include that old thing that I thought was a part of me. Sure. And I'm moving forward in this way. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. with people, it doesn't mean, it means maybe we integrate them in a different way in our life. And, you know, when you really lose people, you have to make we say make friends with grief because she comes to visit whenever she wants and doesn't announce it. Right. Yeah. And, and if you try to push her out the door, she's very insistent. And when she comes, you just have to let her, just let her sit by you and let it be. Mm-hmm. And so that's, you know, the grief process with people, but then the grief process with the dreams too. And every now and then there might be a flooding moment of, wow, I really hate that I've lost that. Right. Yeah, sure. Sure. You know, morning endures for the night, um, you know, but joy, joy comes in the morning and um, it doesn't mean that that wave may not come over you again, you know, later. I think that's, that's very natural. That's very normal. Um, One thing that I've always reminded people and and even coaching soccer all these years, you know, I always told my boys, um, you know, the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Yeah. And if he was our example, and if if he can feel loss and grief and sorrow, certainly and surely we must allow ourselves to feel that as well and give that safe space of grace to one another because people grieve in different ways and and in different seasons. So even if there are those who are grieving over the same loss, um, say a person, uh, one may be feeling it up here at one moment in the day simultaneously while somebody else is here. And so just extending that grace. And if, if it means that we have to go back to um, the power of pause before we open our mouths so we're not just always reactionary, um, I think that can be very healing and very powerful and very productive in navigating through that difficult and painful season mm-hmm. of loss and, and of grief. And there's a reason the word bittersweet exists, right? Yeah. This is only bitter because I had the sweetness, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And so that's the thing about grief. They actually exist at the very same time. Yeah. Boy, yeah, isn't that the truth? And, you know, sometimes when we do come up with a dream, you know, um, 
we have a dream, we have a plan and, and this goal and what we're aspiring to do and, and, you know, what we want to accomplish and, and there's a, a snag in the road or there's loss, you know, like we just talked about. And, and so, you know, we, we, we get back up and, and, and we tweak the dream. And so now maybe it'll be a different approach, but as we're going through that, remember those sweet moments that were in it. And yes, we we can and we still will continue to have those sweet moments. For me, I'm an optimist. And so I, I also embrace the scripture that I call things forth that are not as, as if they were. And so I will... Um, speak things into existence not to be all but at least in my mind um i can see it and i can i can i can visualize it and and i can pursue it Mm -hmm. and i can see the sweetness in the pursuit yes yes uh and I love that, and I, I think there is this incredible power that we have in our mind and in our mouth mm-hmm. to speak things into being. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we're speaking with our children, I think that's a, a good thing to remember. Like, what are we speaking over them? Who yes. are they? Who are we telling them that they are? Yes. Um, you know, who do they have the potential to be? And yeah, speak that life over them and just and speak their that destiny over them. And and even if you haven't seen it manifesting in that moment, do and can we even have the ability first to see that half uh, that glass half full over our little one for their future? Because if we do, then that's what will come out of our mouths. And we're speaking that life and that courage, encouragement and, and edification and vision and hope over our little one. That's inspiring and that's contagious. And they can't help but lift up their head and join that, that, that being a visionary with you and to see that. That's powerful. And kids love it anytime. I've noticed sure. that at bedtime, my kids just love, I have a habit of praying for them. And, you know, if you can speak and pray things, and sometimes that's reading a book for those who don't necessarily do that at night, but that even as they go to sleep to go, there's, you know, this is who you are. This is how I see you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What did we do today? Every day ends and tomorrow's a new day with no mistakes in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's lay it all down here tonight. Tomorrow the sun rises and we get to start again. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, uh, you know, some families will talk about, um, they'll have their little tag phrase and you see it in the movies and stuff, but I know families do that, you know, um, tell me that the shining point of today or, um, you know, I've always asked my kids, you know, tell me two ways that you shine for Jesus today or um, how were you a blessing today or how were you blessed today? Because all of those are so powerful, stirring up those endorphins and and that optimism and, and that hope. And it's just it's just injecting um, just that joy and and sense of purpose and and I think it's tweaking that lens to just be brighter and clearer and sharpening that perspective to see the positive. So as you're seeing, you know, what we're speaking over our kids, Jen, is, um, correct me if, I've, if I'm wrong, I've, I've watched this on TV and social media and, and stuff that I read is, Generation after generation, I see it happening more with the, the, the younger parents, yet even out of the mouths of children, is this um, sharp, sassy sarcasm, that knee-jerk reaction to things. And I think we as parents, our words are powerful. Our little yeah. ones are looking to us. And the words that we speak over them are so powerful. If we can just take a moment and just soften those words and soften our heart and and not be so quick, you know, to speak out the the words of sarcasm. So when a little one says something, you know, we would never want to say, well, that's what I would expect from you or... I don't know. I that's I'm not wired that way. So I've never spoken to my kids that way. Um 
but you've seen it, you've heard it. Uh, I'm probably not give, giving you good examples, but when they are coming with you, how about if that response is going to be focusing on the positive? You know, yes, this happened, but wow, you were able to to do this or to see this or to say that, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think I think some of what you're alluding to, we sometimes call the attention principle, which is what you pay attention to grows. And so you want to be paying attention to the positive things. The attention principle, Abe, can you, or Gabe, can you write that down? The attention principle, got it. Yeah, so what, and that's true for all of us. What we pay attention to grows. So what we pay sure. attention to in our kids grows. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but this has been a rough year and there, I mean, I'm not perfect. I hopefully am growing every year, right? right. And so yep. I can definitely look back as a parent and go, wow, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. And sometimes that can wreck me as a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, I, just this week, I had someone tell me a story about how um, this gal went through a divorce and it was really hard. And she had four kids that she was raising and she knew that she just wasn't thriving and that she wasn't speaking really you know, the way she wanted to with her kids. And so she would actually pray, Lord, will you help them forget everything except love? Just Mm. may they not even have heard anything. I I love that. And sometimes I I love the idea that God can be outside of time and that I could pray it now and it would, it could go over my past Mm -hmm. too. And, and this mom happened to later be there and her adult children were talking and they were talking about how she was so gracious and patient with them all the time. And she said, (laughs) and I knew right then that God had answered my prayer. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It's like all the time. Let's not get it twisted. (laughs) I think somewhere deep inside every parent, knows they would want to speak love over the kid. Nobody sure. wakes up and goes, oh, I want to be an addict and destroy no. my kid's life. Yeah, of right? course not. No. Mm-mm. Nobody does that. And mm-hmm. everybody's doing, I like to believe that everyone is doing the best that they can with what they know and the capacity they have at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've shared this several times on the show, but, um, you know, there's so much power in the tongue and it's the most unruly part of our body. And the tongue could be used to either um, bless or curse. And uh, it's just as easy to go in both directions. And so it's not that that comes automatic, um, you know, to most. So it's a, it's a learned discipline. Yes. And and you have to be gracious with yourself as you learn it. If you don't have that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it'll come, you know, it takes 21 days to form a habit, right? So, uh, you know, there, there'd be the process and going through it. Um, and, you know, maybe if you can have an accountability partner, you know, your husband or a friend or, you know, a cousin or a neighbor or something. And, and you know, you can use them as an accountability partner and just kind of walk through that uh, together, whether they have similar issues or you just want to to verbalize and walk that through with somebody. I think that's a powerful tool as well. Yeah. And we always want to keep the idea that parents are parents and what they say goes, but there is this beautiful principle of up and down mentorship and we can mm-hmm. invite our children to help us remember to. Yeah. Yep. And can we have open enough hearts to let that be? Yeah. Right. Yep. And that, Absolutely. I think, and we all need to kind of be in a place where someone who maybe we don't see as our leader, mm-hmm. if they're speaking truth to be able to hear what they say to us. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think the first step for that, Jen, is um, not bowing to pride, um, not let, um, not allowing pride to lead our decision making in that, because that would take humility first. And humility is so powerful. It's another very powerful tool. That we, I wish that we understood that, that our society understood the power of humility. Yeah, it's explosive. It's like putting a seed in the ground and pounding it, and you can't keep it down, right? That tree's yeah. gonna grow up. Yeah, that's humility. That's humility. Yeah, the tree of humility bears much fruit. Mm-hmm. Season after season after season. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and I'm, which I've never said that before. That 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 just came to me, and and also as I'm looking at this tree. Um, in order to bear the fruit and, and all those blossoms, Jen, they need to be they need to be pruned. 
every year, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's important that we are allowed um, to be pruned, which takes humility. So it's A affects B affects C, but it is, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Yeah. Um, Jen, I was just looking here at my notes and one thing we were talking about earlier is, uh, Gabe, if you can put that up on his, the screen again, um, the, the suicide hotline that is out there uh, for anybody to use. Um, we we hope and we encourage you um, to reach out if you you know, are feeling um, thoughts of despair and desperation to the point of taking your own life. Um, you know, we encourage you to reach out and to reach out um, in that moment um, uh, of of despair before you get into that that deep moment of of crisis and Jen can you uh, share with the folks the importance of reaching out even even for therapy mental health is so important and I think that stigma has been going away you know the last 15 10 eight six years um, there are, are wonderful therapists that are out there counselors who are out there uh, just like Jen uh, the name of Jen's practice is um, finding home counseling.com I know you can't take on um, new clients right now I know that you have just that that long waiting list, um, but there are th- tens of thousands of gens out there across the country. So where can folks uh, reach out, Jen, do you think, through their local insurance or HR departments or? Yeah, well, actually, both of those are really great ideas. A lot of places have EAPs where they'll mm-hmm. actually cover a few sessions mm-hmm. free. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you might, your employer may actually offer that. <laughs> A lot of insurances, well, actually, as far as I know, every insurance right now during COVID is offering telehealth. And what that means is mm. if you go to your insurance, there may be therapists that you couldn't access before because of distance, but because you'd be meeting with them via Zoom, right. you actually can see them. Right. At this yeah. Time, right. Yeah. So yeah. that means yeah. that all of a sudden, a lot of the barriers we had as far as connecting with someone or feeling like, Oh, I'm in a small town and I know everybody, those barriers are kind of thrown off. Yeah. And that's really fabulous. What is that? uh, What's that commercial um, Jen with the, the Olympic swimmer? What's his name? That won the seven gold medals. He has a commercial out now where he's, Yes, Michael Phelps. Thank you. Yeah. There's a commercial that's running right now and it's, it's promoting, um, reaching out to, for mental health care. And he's he's online with his therapist and he's like out in the Sedona desert, you know, just out in this beautiful space, which adds to the, the ambiance of the commercial. But he's right there on his iPad talking to, you know, his counselor who can be, you know, 5,000 miles away. Who knows? Yeah. And I believe that he, that's either for talk space or better help that are both mm-hmm. Those are both um, almost cash pay subscription style um, Mm -hmm. counseling services that are available online. And that's if someone's worried about stigma, you're paying cash. There's no record of this, right? When you go through insurance, there has to be a diagnosis. Um, In those situations, it's not it's not contingent on diagnosis. It's just there's a place for you to talk. A lot of times they will offer things like texting, um, you know, so you can just text your therapists whenever the thought hits you and wow. there's kind of this ongoing dialogue through the week so there are some really great options uh, when we're able to embrace embrace technology mm-hmm. so. well i'll tell you one thing in this season it has been very encouraging to watch so many people think outside of the box they, I mean, we were we we are forced to, but people are stepping up to the plate, and there are there are far more tools and services and options that are available to you, to me, to all of us today. And so we encourage you to reach out, uh, and and if anything, even right here, just locally, as we all say here at Solmanad, reach out across the aisle, across the street, across town, whatever it is, even if it's just you know virtually, but reach out stay in community do not withdraw stay plugged in in community we love you we need you you are loved and 
for those of us who are concerned about another, instead of saying what we always say, um, hey, I'm here for you if you need anything. How about if we are intentional and we actually reach out to them and say, hi, I was just checking on you today. How are you doing? Do you want to meet in the Starbucks uh, parking lot, you and your car, me and mine, and we can chat and have a cup of coffee? You know, do, do you have time for a quick FaceTime and reach out to them? Because, you know, we still and we always will have some people who just won't reach out and ask for that assistance. And so if we can all do our part together, together we can and together we will. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, going into this season, I think people thought I was a little crazy. I had this knowing in my heart before we went into lockdown that this was going to be a profound change. Um, I said it was, I said, I think this is going to be as big for technology as the industrial mm. revolution was. Right. Oh, yeah. And so with it, there's this mixed thing of necessity is the mother of invention. Mm-hmm. And as much pressure as we have from the outside, that creative part of us is just waiting to burst forth and, and bring something yeah. new to the planet that's never existed before. Yeah. Like if we can like pull onto that, we can be people beyond imagination. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's just so much power and um, creativity that is within each and every one of us. And, um, you know, we don't need to hold back. We can dream again. And, you know, it is my prayer that 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 God stir up the dream within each and every one of the within each and every one of us so that our dreams are not squashed. Our dreams are not dead. And yet, of course, we do recognize that this has been a season of great loss and and much mourning and and much grief. We do recognize that. But we are here today um, after recognizing that we are here to encourage you and to love on you. Jen, I thank you for being on the Soul Monad Show with Sonia today uh, to share just these nuggets of wisdom and, and of truth. I, I think you've been such an encouragement uh, to myself and, and to our viewers. So I thank you so much for Jen for being on today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. So much. Yeah. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our viewers before we sign off, Jen? No, I love how you just ended. I thought that was beautiful. It's we can dream again. Right. And I couldn't help but put that in when what we were talking about with humility and sometimes these pressure cookers are what Mm. explode out new horizons, new births, new things. And, And maybe that's how do we stir up our dreams? Yeah. You know, it's interesting that that we're we're kind of um, going to be wrapping up winter here in the month of February ish, right? And we're coming into spring. And what is spring? Spring is the season of new beginnings, and I think we are right on the cusp of one of the seasons of new beginnings, the biggest seasons of new beginnings that that our country has seen in modern times, and. I'm excited and I'm hopeful for it and and I'm just willing to just embrace it and um, and I have expectation for great and beautiful and wonderful and new things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. I think that's a great way for us to sign yeah, off. Yeah. Well, Jen, thank you so much for being on this show. Uh, before we leave here, I do just want to say happy birthday to my mom. You know, it's mom's birthday. Yeah. It's my mom's birthday this weekend. So happy birthday to mom. I love you so much. Um yeah, she's all, she really is like your your uh, auntie. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at it in that beautiful. I just love that. Yeah. So happy birthday to my mom, and also this week, shout out to my girl Roz. Happy birthday to you and to Elaine and to Tammy. I love you guys. I'm so grateful for the wonderful, beautiful women in my life that are just in my tribe, in my village, in my crew, and and it's just such an honor and a blessing to do life with you i learned so much from you and i love you and and god bless all of you on your birthdays mom i love you so much i'll be calling you in a little bit i know that you're watching right now i'll call you in a little bit and we'll get you out there to seattle tomorrow so that you can help auntie carol when she comes 
home, back into her house. So love you, mom. Happy birthday. Happy birthday from the Earth and Tribe, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I thank you so much for joining us here on the Soul Monad Show with Sonia today. Uh, we just hope that you are blessed, that you are encouraged, and that you will take these tools and apply them to your own life and be hopeful and, and dream again. So y'all stay blessed in whatever you put your hands to do. Until next time. Ciao.